Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let our memories lead back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was going through a file that I keep on Christmas worship, all the things we do and things to remember, and I came across the very first thing on the page, and it's written in giant red letters with 20 exclamation marks behind it, and it says, count the candles. And it all came back to me. It was about 20 years ago, and it was just a few days before Christmas, and we went to where we stored the candles that we use for Silent Night, and had discovered that they had melted into one gigantic blob. Now, this is pre-Amazon. There were only a couple of Christian bookstores on the island, and they primarily sold those little porcelain statues, and we panicked. I mean, we panicked. We sat there and very carefully did everything we could, breaking out as many of the candles as we could and reshaping them, and we managed to come up with enough for Christmas Eve. And hence this note. We, we, by the way, also placed a quick order with Concordia saying we need two boxes of candle and we kept them in a much cooler place. If you keep a diary or even just some notes on your life, or maybe it's, you know, uh, when you're watching the TV and if you have one of those Amazon fires and all of a sudden when it goes to, you know, your pictures pop up or maybe your Microsoft or Apple screensaver, it's amazing what it reveals. We suddenly remember the weather, who came to visit us, what movie we saw, the dreams that we had. And even though it's just a few notes or a single picture, that particular day or moment is resurrected and it becomes real again. We might even remember what it felt like. So Moses wrote Psalm 90. Now this is the same Moses whose face glowed, who went up on a mountain to meet with God, uh, who told Pharaoh, let my people go, and then parted the Red Sea. Obviously, it's a very good psalm since it survived over a thousand years, and David thought it was good enough to put into his book of psalms. It's also one of my favorites because it speaks a life truth. Teach me to number my days aright, O God, that I may gain a heart of wisdom. See, the best part of being whatever age you are is that you are still all the ages you always were. You don't stop being four or 18 or 25. You just are a better version of yourself. Not so much a better version, but a more complete version of yourself. It's kind of like when you're watching something update on your computer and it says 1%, 2%, and then it gets to like 6% and it just stalls for this extended period of time. And then it jumps up to 30 and then it, you know, slowly makes its way up to 100%. There are parts of your life that are like molasses. And there are parts that fly by so quickly, you didn't even have time to live them. A minute and an hour doesn't change, but our perception of them does. So when Moses said, our years come to an end like a sigh, that's at the very beginning, not recorded in our scriptures today, I don't think it was one of those exasperated or angry sighs. I think it was the kind where we look out over all that we've done, all that we were, all that we are. It's beyond anything we're imagined. We're taken aback. We sigh at the beauty of it all because we know that a picture, a diary, a painting would never be able to duplicate our life, never, never be able to fully explain what we felt, what we experienced, the things we loved, the things that changed us, the people that came in and out. So what are your expectations for life? What do you want to be when you grow up, no matter what age you are now? What's on your bucket list if you have one? What one thing, if you could narrow it down from now until whenever you go home to be with Jesus, what is the one thing that you would like to accomplish above everybody else? And you would even be willing to sacrifice other things to accomplish that one thing. In our gospel lesson, the man walks up to Jesus. Now, people were always walking up to Jesus, you know, to ask questions. But what's significant about this one is three out of the four gospels tell this story. And it's almost identical. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us that he's young. Luke tells us he's considered a ruler. Mark is the only one who says Jesus still loves the rich young ruler, even though he chooses his wealth over God. Now, skipping to the end, what do you think happened to this guy after he left? 
the Bible doesn't say. Maybe in his old age he softened his love for stuff and he gave it all away and became a pastor. Maybe he got hit by a chariot crossing the street and that was the end. Maybe he continued his love for stuff and um, he died the richest man in all of Israel, but alone and without God. To be honest, it doesn't matter. I know we all like to know, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, but that defeats the actual purpose of this verse. See, last week I noted if you were enslaved by your stuff, and by the way, we have to add enslaved by your titles, diplomas, honors, all the things that we put on the me wall that we're so proud of ourselves for doing. It can keep us from being happy, from making a difference, from being us. Reading about all the folks who chose not to evacuate, either for Helene and now for Milton, and so often they said, you, you just don't understand. This is too important, whether it was their boat, their house, or their stuff. If we're so worried about someone dinging our car, stealing our computer, beating our high score, or a hurricane wiping out our accomplishments, we're going to use all of our energy and time just protecting stuff that's eventually going to rot, rust, become obsolete, or get stolen anyway. We're never really going to get the chance to live. To really get at what Jesus is pushing us toward, we have to ask, so what does it mean to be saved? And I don't want the catechism answer. I don't want the one that you had to write down for your confirmation exam. I don't even want the Bible verse that you've got memorized. I want to know what your definition of being saved is, your, your personal definition as it applies to you. See, if we're honest, we're all going to have a little different definition based upon where we're at in our life, our age, our job, our relationships, our family. Whereas being saved ultimately gets us into heaven. And lust, like that thief on the cross that literally came to faith and was in heaven like a minute later, we have to keep living our life after we're saved. That's why I want to know what your definition of being saved is because it's going to determine how you're going to live your life. The Gospels are filled with stories of Jesus loving and healing people. There's the woman whose menstrual cycle won't stop, and she spent every dime she had, and nobody can help her. There's the man whose son has uncontrollable epileptic seizures that are threatening his life. There's the woman that's had five failed marriages, currently living with somebody, can't find a relationship that works. There were the crippled, the deaf, the lepers. Last week it was all the little children who the disciples kept shooing away from the very important Jesus. And while Jesus doesn't deal with the issue directly, St. Paul gets caught up in the lives of people who are slaves, not just to sin, but actual slaves of other people. And I should mention all the Gentiles who were removed from the promise of the Messiah by the church leadership, and they were called Goyim, which means not one of us. And by the way, you have to add them looking down their noses with that air of superiority as they speak the word. You see, these are the people that Jesus saved. The older a pastor gets, the harder it is to tell the story of Jesus with a fresh twist. Now, it's not that the story itself needs any help, but we feel like we need to say or do something to get your attention. See, I remember being a kid, and my mom was always telling me that she loved me over and over again. And by the time I became a teenager, I, I was so embarrassed when my mom would say it in front of my friends. Eventually, I got to the point where I didn't hear the words anymore. Even though I saw her lips moving, I knew what she was saying, though. They were just words because I'd heard them a million times. It wasn't until she suffered a stroke. And I had to look into her eyes and hear the words that she could no longer speak. And I wished I'd listened more often. And then it was in the middle of the pandemic, and it was that last Zoom right before she died. And it may have been just my imagination, but I believe that I saw her lips moving, and that's what I will believe until the day that we are reunited in heaven. See, if us pastors struggle to find fresh ways of speaking the gospel, it is not to add anything, but rather to put something into the back of your brain or maybe deep into your soul so that no matter who you are and what is happening in your life, even if you have not heard those words from God for a very long time because you put your fingers in your ears and did the nah, 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 I can't hear you thing, you can look into the eyes of God and remember the words that He has always spoken to you or see His lips move and know the words even if you can't hear them. You see, the gospel is faithful even when you're not. 
The reason it doesn't matter what happened to this rich young ruler after he left Jesus is because we've made the story about his money, and that is not his problem. The problem is his soul. See, if the problem was just his money, then God could just get rid of all of his money and his problems would be over. Or if his problem, by the way, was his good looks or his fame or his athletic ability or his brain, then God could just take away whatever that was and the problem would be solved. Now, he would be poor or ugly or unknown or average, but he would be saved. It doesn't work that way, does it? Money, like anything else, doesn't change a person. It just makes them more of whatever they were in the first place. When Jesus said, if I can't trust you with little things, I know I can't trust you with big stuff, it's because the problem is not the stuff. It's the person's soul. The only good news is that God specializes in saving the soul and not saving stuff. In John 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. Now, because Jesus does it on the Sabbath day, the church leadership gets all upset and they decide they want to stone Jesus. But of course, they have to have proof. So they drag everybody in, including the blind man's parents, in order to interview them for evidence. Twice, by the way, they bring in the guy who was born blind. Interestingly, they, they never use Jesus' name. They claim they don't know anything about him, including where he was born. The only thing they know is that Jesus must be a sinner because he is not following their rules. Now, the second time they asked the man born blind about his healing, the man doesn't disappoint. He says, look, I don't know whether Jesus is a sinner or not. Here's the one thing I do know. I once was blind, but now I see. And those would be great words to write a song. Oh, we meant John Newton already did. See, the church leadership weren't very good at remembering the Bible, but the man born blind was. Because Isaiah 35 says that when God shows up, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Even, by the way, on a Sabbath day. And Isaiah makes it clear, it's not being able to hear or see or leap like a deer that really matters. What matters is that God is on the move, which is why Isaiah finishes that beautiful passage with, the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. There's that word sighing again, only in this case, it really was the sad, morose, terrible sign versus the sign of Moses that looks out and goes, This is amazing, God. The gospel gets told by fishermen and farmers, pregnant ladies and squirmy kids, sinners and saints, shepherds and wise men, Pharisees and dying thieves. And by the way, the stories, they smell like hay and animal poop. The ocean and the rain taste like salt and bread and wine. Sounds like parties and worship services and nails being pounded into a cross. And it looks, it looks like light chasing away the darkness. No two people see Jesus the exact same way. Not once does somebody pray the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus into their heart in the Bible. Not everyone believes in him. Some say they do when you're not so sure they really do, and others say they don't and you're pretty sure that they do. To be saved is something very different for the woman caught in the act of adultery, the man born blind, the woman at the well, the centurion, Nicodemus, and all the others, which is why the gospel is told from their perspectives. See, the gospel is a mosaic, each story a tiny fragment that when seen up close and personal is a beautiful thing. But when it's seen in part of the whole and the much larger story, it becomes overwhelming. And that brings us back to Psalm 90 and Moses' sigh in our life being measured by what we choose to do with our minutes, our days, and our years. Later today when you're alone unless you want to be really annoying, then you can just do this wherever you are in the midst of a large crowd. I want you to pick a word, a word that means something to you, a word that you love to hear. And I want you to repeat it out loud 50 times. And by the way, no cheating, no whispering, no repeating it so fast that the words all sling together. No, I want you to repeat it in such a way that it's 50 times just over and over and over again. Pay attention to how you speak the word. Pay attention how you say it at the beginning and how you say it at the end. See, at some point, words just become noise. They lose their meaning, even if they are words that we normally love. We hear them so often that they lose their meaning. I know I tell you that you're unique and unreproducible a lot. And by the way, when you walk into the sanctuary, those words are a lot of different places. It may have become just noise to you, but I'm okay with that. The subconscious is a wonderful thing. It acts like a diary, like like little notes about your life. It remembers things that you think you forgot. And then a smell, a sound, a touch brings it all back. 
See, we tend to think we have so many days and hours and minutes left that if we waste a few, it's no big deal. And we do, and we do. Uh, but if we want to talk about spiritual gifts, the gifts cannot be used outside of time and space. Meaning we have to make the time in order to put them into practice. It's, it's called sanctification. It's the act of living out our salvation. It's, it's taking our justification and making it real in the lives of others. See, the gospel is not made to just be words spoken by a pastor or read from a book or listened to on a Sunday. The gospel is a story of life and love and eternity. And it was given and lived so that your life and your story will never be the same once those two stories emerge, the story of Jesus and the story of you. You don't have to fully understand who you are in Jesus for him to use you to change the world. If you read the story that takes place after the crucifixion, you realize the disciples, you know, the ones who actually walked and talked and hung out with Jesus and got to ask him questions, they were still trying to figure it out. But God used them to do the most amazing things. Lives were changed. Souls were saved. Eternities were discovered. You can't take credit for your passions, your time, or your talent. Uh, you didn't create them. And you didn't choose them. They're gifts, pretty obviously. Your only choice is how you use them. And something to think about. If your life is so full of yourself or your stuff, well, there's no room for God to put his gifts. You know who you are. You know your deep gladness. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out where the world's deep need is. God put you here for a reason, and he made you a unique and unreproducible miracle. You are perfectly suited for your calling. Now, you've heard God say I love you a billion times in the stars and the rain and the sun and the people around you. And even if your life or the state of the world right now means that you can't hear him speak those words, just look into his eyes. Look into the creation that he put all around you. Watch his lips. Know that you're loved. You see, when it comes to living the life that he's given you, well, there's nothing left to do but try. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.